Hello. This week, I'm at Block Dojo in London to meet the latest group of entrepreneurs to complete this incubator program for startups that are building their businesses on the BSV blockchain. I'll be finding out about ideas to train Web3 developers, to simplify house buying, and to improve accident reporting to car insurers. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. First up, Rafaela Azevedo wants to help developers acquire the skills they need for Web3 projects. The Chain Academy will offer training and link potential employers to qualified candidates. It is an educational platform for developers that want to uh, enter in Web3. And we are going to provide this um, guided path with small tasks. And then after this, they can uh, just get this instant feedback so they know where they are failing. And they are going to be skilled up to collaborative commercial projects where they go and uh, they can actually have the first experience and create a portfolio. What's the difference or is it, how much of a difference is there between being a developer for Web3 versus just being a developer? Uh, the Web3 is the new tech coming, so it's the new wave. So you need to understand what uh, is blockchain, how you can implement these, and all these uh, is a bit more uh, technical and also um, is, is basically a new way to put things in the, in the database. The database is, not, is, is like decentralized. So you need to know uh, the concepts of the blockchain and also the technology around that. So. And does the Chain Academy uh, address itself to all different blockchains or? Different... Yeah, yeah, this is, our, uh, this is our goal basically. We are gonna start just with Solidity, which is the most popular one, and Ethereum. And then after this, we are gonna start rolling out to other uh, blockchains as well. Right, because Block Dojo has traditionally been the Bitcoin SV blockchain. Will you be including that? Yes, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> I think you have to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is this is in our roadmap. Yeah, and also another thing that you know, talking with uh, the customers already because we have this waiting list. Uh, one of the things they uh, they complain about the current platforms and also why they struggle so much to come to uh, blockchain and learn is the lack of roadmap where they can go because there are so many in the world right now and it's always like it's an evolving tech so it's hard to keep up with everything so will it be videos or written text or how's it going to work so it's going to be you know step by step so it's going to uh, they have like a roadmap to sh to know what is the blockchain they want to code and then after this with the step by step they will have the short uh, videos and like short text you know, because nowadays we have this uh, short span of attention. Uh, and yes, is, uh, I'm included. And uh, uh, these long tutorials, longer videos, they just don't work, right? You just lose yourself in the middle. So it's going to be really uh, short. And then uh, after this, if of course, if they want to go uh, a bit deeper, we will put like resources so they, they can go and try more. And is this for somebody who starts off knowing absolutely nothing or do you expect some sort of basic knowledge? Yeah, so they need to have a uh, basic knowledge in coding, programming, any language is fine. But then yes, they need to have some kind. That's why we are targeting like university students. Uh, they have kind of basic uh, during the, the their own course, yeah. On the money making side of it, then what kind of revenue models are you thinking about? Yeah, so we have the subscription model for the developers that are uh, coming, doing the course, getting certificates, and uh, they can go to the premium one where they will have some kind of mentorship uh, from other developers. And also for the business, they pay like a, um, a fee to post the project there. So it can be like MVP, even like, you know, business that don't know how to use a blockchain and they want to explore. They can post the project like MVP, uh, POC, uh, this proof is, of concept. This is jobs. People want jobs done. So. Yeah, it's like outsourcing, yeah. yeah. And um, small projects, uh, for example. Mm. 
And uh, on the other side, also the recruitment. So because we are going to use AI to, you know, give you instant feedback for these developers, we will be able to access, uh, you know, what are the parts they are good with and uh, what there are, you know, these skills as well. So basically the recruitment part is another fee that the companies, they will pay to recruit these developers and they can already see what are the skills uh, they have. I mean, on the learning side, I, I may be wrong, but I, I think there's an awful lot of just free information and videos and stuff out there. And these techie people who want to learn this stuff, I would have thought would be pretty savvy about just finding stuff that they're not having to pay for. I agree. And then, uh, yeah, the thing is, it's spread around. And another thing is uh, Web3 people, they go to Discord and Discord is, it's, it started as small, but nowadays it's like super spread around. So people go and they just feel lost. They don't know uh, what to do. Again, it's a, a lack of uh, guidance. That's what we are focusing as well. But so also, we I suppose if you issue your own certificate at the end to say this person has achieved this, then that is that part of the plan? Yeah, so they will uh, get the certificate with what they achieved. Uh, so the first course, the first part of the course, and then the second part with the collaboration project as well, the commercial experience. Um, and then, of course, because uh, Web3 is an evolving tech, is always uh, changing, they will probably need to come back at some point to re-educate themselves and keep up to date with the technology. And just tell me a bit about your own background then. How did you get into this? Yeah, so um, it's pretty curious because all my family is in tech. Uh, my mom, she used to be a Kobo developer and then she became a teacher for kids and teenagers in the tech industry as well. Uh, my dad, he was a Kobo developer as well and he opened his own company. It was a software consultancy um, and he was also like uh, teaching people how to use, you know, it was really back in the age how to turn on the computer, how to use the mouse, how to use Microsoft Word and Excel. Um, and I saw these really, really close, uh, you know, the problems that my dad uh, had with keeping up to date with technology. He had to close down his business, basically. And um, my mom, she had to become a, te a teacher, basically. And yeah, then I was coding when I was Six, year old, six years old with my dad, yeah, and then I just got really passionate about uh, the area and just went for it, so. So, but now as the founder of this company, you'll be much more on the business side than on the technical side, I imagine. Yes, yes, I am. So it, it's hard to uh, handle because I really like programming, of course. <laughs> It is like my hobby. Um, I was doing like during the weekends, uh, coding when I was 14 years old already. And uh, yeah, now I'm in the business side. I can help with the code, but yeah, it's not going to be uh, something that I'm going to do all the time anymore. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a fantastic project. So I really wish you every luck with it. And um, I, I might even have a go myself if it's, if it's you know, easy enough. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> yeah, everybody will be able to do it. Yeah, no. Thank you very much, Rafaela. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I met Kenneth Kelly, who wants to make buying and selling houses easier and quicker. His revested business will use blockchain technology to cut out practices which have been in place for decades. The problem in the industry, going back to my grandfather's time, would be um, one in three properties fall through. Um, on, a, on average, it's taken between three to six months. So, you know, huge problem within the, within the space. It's a hugely stressful experience for a lot of individuals um, when they're dealing with their probably their biggest asset for some. Um, so, you know, going back to the 1900s, you look at how it was done then to when my father purchased his property in the, you know, 80s, 90s, um, to when I purchased my property last year, nothing has changed. I think anyone who's been involved in buying or selling a house will relate to what you've said, but how can you make that better then? Yeah, so we revested, what we're trying to do is to streamline a lot of the mundane processes um, of putting properties, like the whole compliance and regulatory side of a property is probably the biggest uh, factor that causes it, you know, the, the, the time um, problem. So KYC of when you come on to Revest is you upload simple. Uh, we've partnered with Ofido, whereby you 
enter your name, email, passport, and take a photograph of yourself. Um, you then upload your property title deeds uh, or some description of the property, which a lot of people will have. We can actually cross check that using machine learning against the land registry document to then push it to a digital exchange. Whereas previously you'd just be asked to send a copy of that to your estate agent or your solicitor, I suppose. Yeah, and I mean, it would sit on a desk for probably six to eight months and never, yes. never get done. So the long, I mean, looking at the, the transaction, the longer that it stayed in the solicitor's hands, you know, they were getting paid. And um, so we're kind of bringing all of those um, intermediaries to the forefront, to the start of the process, getting it resolved before they go to a digital exchange. And um, so the London Stock Exchange are looking at this quite, you know, in depth at the moment. Uh, regulatory standards across the UK um, and Europe have, have loosened. You know, you look at Germany, we're, you know, three to five years behind what's happening there. So why would the stock exchange be involved? Well, if you look at how much is caught up in, you know, illiquid assets, it's over 4.6 trillion. So that's a huge amount of volume that's caught and, and can't be liquidized. Um, you look at the, the market we're currently in, you know, we're get, going down into more turmoil times when, when illiquid or when the liquidization of assets needs to become, you know, faster, more efficient and more reliable. You mean the stock exchange might be getting itself involved in property buying and selling um yes well the tokenization of digital assets so they're getting involved in that in the whole exchange right so w what do we mean exactly by tokenization here yeah so it's a good question so you look at um the current process uh, of the land registry and um, what we're looking to do is digitalize that using blockchain technology and data layers so we're building a custom layer two platform so in Simple layman's terms, it's essentially going to be a digital exchange to connect a wallet dependent upon the currency and to be able to trade that currency in and out of the exchange. Are we seriously saying that if I want to sell my house, I can tokenize it and then at the press of a button on my phone, sell it to somebody? Exactly. You could be down in the pub on a Friday and you could be selling your property <laughs> in, 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 in minutes, instantly. That could be quite dangerous and um, in what sense do you think it's dangerous so i think it's such a big decision in your life that in a way the sort of the slowness of solicitors and as you mentioned is is a, a safety factor in a way because you get a second chance to think and nothing is going to happen before you realize what's happening well i mean if you look at and use the banking space as a you've got these new uh, you know entrants within to this you know within to the space whereby in a second, you can trade currency. Um, so what's stopping REITs, large landowners being able to, to free up assets quicker? Um, you know, give the example of someone who's um, cash rich, uh, or sorry, uh, you know, asset rich and cash poor and needs to take out liquidity because of a, a personal circumstance. So conveyancing could literally happen at the push of a button. At the bush of a button using machine learning. I don't think, you know, AI doesn't exist. So yeah, there's new machine learning models that are really pushing boundaries within the, the legal space. Why does machine learning come into it? Well, you could scan title deeds and check for underlying lease issues, problems essentially. Um, and the whole, you know, maintenance of a property can be um, kept in a, lo in a log with, within the document. Um, and within revested. So we're looking to, you know, reinvent um, investing. That's really what we're I mean, with solicitors, if I'm employing a solicitor to help with buying or selling my house, I would hope that they've been properly trained. But I would also believe that if they messed up, I would have some recourse to uh, complain about that and something would happen. Will your company be taking on those kind of risks and responsibilities if it's doing that work yeah there's a whole insurance efficient. yeah there's a whole insurance element to the, to what we're building an insure tech um, and we're looking at you know partnering with legal firms we've got a board of a couple of bodies who are in quite a large amount of legal background um so yeah it's definitely we know there's there's hurdles to get over within the the legal space um but we are looking to push the boundaries and disrupt um, a very 
uh, what would I say, traditional model. It sounds like an amazing idea, but it, I wonder whether it's an idea that can only really happen when you've got everything in place. I mean, it, it's not something you can start off gradually, is it? It either works or it doesn't work. Well, I mean, it's been done. It's been done in America. It's been done across Europe and some, I'd say, a handful of transactions in the UK um, using slightly different instruments, different ways to 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 sell and and. Yeah, basically you're selling a property um, on, on, on the blockchain. So you're using blockchain technology to to sell assets. And what would the business model be for your company? Would you just take a percentage of the sales or what? Yeah, we, we would take a percentage of transaction transaction fees based on, a, you know, dependent upon the size and volume of the transaction. There might be some administrative um, fees for larger portfolio clients who might have, you know, couple of hundred properties or even into the thousands. Um, but if you look at all the family offices around the country, they don't have an ability to free up liquidity fast. And to those people who are trying to do it, I don't believe they have the domain knowledge, the data experience um, and the tech that we have. So we have a team of guys who have come out of, you know, they've built blockchain labs in Fox production. Um, they've looked at, you know, huge amounts of volume in terms of the amount of assets they've traded was a couple of hundred million. So we've done this before. Um, I've previously built a property valuation model, um, which we're tying in um, some elements in terms of being able to value portfolios far quicker. So, you know, while you're down in the pub on a Friday, you can see, right, the current value of my house or my portfolio is X. And that's based on information as opposed to you having to ring your estate agent and for him to do two weeks of work to get that value. Well, really good luck with it. Um, sounds like an incredible project. and Appreciate it. Hope it works out. <laughs> Thanks thank, for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Finally today, I talked to Marcus Odubonojo, whose own experience led him to create a startup called Motion Shield, which focuses on a rather specific situation involving cars, insurance and accidents. So Marcus, perhaps you could start off by telling me what the problem that Motion Shield is designed to solve, could you? Yeah, sure. So what we have seen in society today is the fact that we have frustrated drivers who unfortunately have been involved in a car accident and the processes involved in reporting the incident to the insurance company. It's just far too difficult and it's just broken. It's not working. So what we do is we simplify the processes by digitizing the road incident reporting processes for drivers to their insurance companies. But also we aim to improve the way insurance companies work so they can actually, you know, increase their or, or improve their reputation as an organization, but also save money because it costs them a lot of money in the way that they work at the moment, which just isn't um, helpful for their customers. So if I have an accident in my car, uh, what would I have an app on my phone or how would it work exactly? Yeah, so you would have the motion shield app on your phone and we could automatically detect if you was to be involved in an accident and then you would have to verify that you have been involved in an accident. And in real time, you can record the incident. You can exchange details with other drivers. You can verify the time and location of the incident. And also you can add notes, for example, a statement of the incident, which pictures or videos can't. So would it be my insurance company that, sort of tells me to get your app or would it would it be something that I would just decide for myself to get? So your insurance company would tell you to upload the app on your phone as part of your insurance premium package. Right. Yeah. Right. So so your customer as a business is are the insurance company. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And how sort of receptive do you think they will be to to this? Well insurance companies know that the current systems that they are using cost them too much money because they're not being they're not profitable at the moment. Insurance because it's a lot of conversations with people. Absolutely, over. absolutely. It costs them far too much time and resources. What we're doing is saving them that the trouble, the pain of you know speaking with their customers um, because of the high demand of people that they have to you know speak to. But we're actually improving the way the way the way they work, and so by utilizing our product and services, they can save millions. So how did you come to this idea? What, what made you, because you, you already had a successful career as a project engineer and all sorts of different businesses. What, why did you suddenly change direction and, and start this business? For one, I love driving. And unfortunately, I was involved in a car accident. 
And so I got to feel the pain of what it was like to report the incident to my insurance company. And throughout the process, I realized there's an opportunity here to improve the way insurance companies work, but also the way drivers feel if they are involved in a car accident. So what we do is bridge the gap between insurance providers and their customers. And you're on this BlockJojo program. Does blockchain, how does blockchain come into your idea? Absolutely. So blockchain comes into our, our idea for, for you know, different um, features. For example, what we do is we take pictures and videos at the scene. Now, where we store those evidence is critical because we want to store that on the blockchain. So you'll be telling the person with the app, now please take some photographs or something, will you? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. So then those get uploaded to the blockchain. Yes. And how is that better than just sending it to the insurance company or something? Well, the fact is that the time of the event and the timestamp activities is what's critical because what we want to do is eliminate, eliminate the fact that drivers can manipulate the data. Um, and by having timestamp activities, we can know that this is a true event that's happened. And so insurance companies will have confidence that the data being submitted is an actual uh, claim that is is a real one. And so what will be the first step in getting this idea rolling? I mean, will you have to sort of sign up one big customer first or how, how will you get it started, do you think? Yeah, so we're currently speaking with a number of insurance companies and we are talking to them about how we can improve the way they work and essentially save them money. So what we want to do is onboard customers you know, on a free trial, let them see how the platform works and, and the benefits of it. And when they start to see some type of return on, on, on that investment, then we can enroll them on board on, onto you know, a longer contract. Well, it sounds like a brilliant idea and I wish you every luck with it. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Rafaela, Kenneth and Marcus. Next week, I'll be meeting the final three entrepreneurs from this Block Dojo cohort. So please join me for that. But until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Hey everybody, I'm Kurt Walker Jr. Join us live on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where you can ask me questions, comments, blessings, cursing, scrapes, gripes, or gropes. You can catch us live across CoinGeeks, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and probably a whole bunch of other places too. I think the big thing here, the big innovation, is the Ordinal's numbering system. So utility is driven by this whole idea of springboarding us in terms of innovation by using micropayments and unlocking all these different new ways of doing things. Decentralization, the meme, as people think of it, I don't think exists at all anywhere. Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin wallet, blockchain, stable coins, Metanet, the evolution of money. Everybody is talking about Bitcoin today, but what exactly is it? Learn the basics from experts. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Blockchain 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.